Hello and welcome back. Today we are cleaning up some code. If you want to be a great software engineer, you can't be writing bad code. And I know that this topic of writing clean code or good code is not the sexiest topic in the world. It might seem a bit boring, but writing good, clean code rather than filthy, disgusting code, it's just something that you'll have to learn at some point if you want to be a great software engineer. So you might as well do that now. If I'm completely honest, I'm not always the best at writing the cleanest code in the world and this is a total excuse but it's because I haven't really been forced to learn to write really good code yet because my full-time job hasn't started yet so mostly I'm just writing code for myself but I am determined to change my ways because my full-time job as a software engineer is starting in about two weeks so here are five tips that if you implement all of these in all your code, it's gonna help you write literally 80% better code, which is gonna put you above like 95% of all the beginners who never bothered to learn any of this. But with that, before you start, I'd appreciate if you go clean up the like button down below in the description. And while you're down there, you might as well also give the subscribe button a bit of a wipe if that's what you're into. But with that, let's start cleansing some code. I've got my lemon water as well as my coffee over here because it's currently 6.40 a.m. in the morning where I'm filming this. So these two should give me enough power to actually get through this really bad, filthy code. Okay, we first need to understand what does good code even mean? To me, code is clean if it can be understood easily, not just by you, but by everyone. Just imagine someone who's never seen your code before, who has no idea what you're trying to do, will they easily be able to understand what you're trying to do with your code without having to think about it for like 10 hours? Because the biggest challenge with coding is not actually even making it so that the computer can understand it, but the challenge is making your code so that humans can understand it. Because in larger organization and when you're building anything significant, you're gonna be working with teams. It makes it so much harder to fix bugs, to work together and to write good software and not only that even if you write something just for yourself when you go back to it later you might not even understand what you were trying to do before if you can't remember and this is something that's definitely never happened to me with my own programs i definitely never go back to my own code and have no idea what i was trying to do before first example here we have this function that is trying to insert a sound effect piece of data into a list and we've got this if statement to check whether it's a valid piece of data essentially okay if you just look at this for like two seconds can you tell what we're actually trying to check for here i mean yeah if you look at this for like two minutes you can definitely tell this is bad code because it's really hard to read this really long conditional if statement what we want to do instead do it sort of one by one and wrap all of these into variables and if i just paste the good code example here so essentially we're wrapping all of this checking into this one function that we only need to do once and after that you don't even really need to know what is going on under the hood because the actual checking is just if is valid sound effect then append it this function is going to return true if it is valid data and it is going to return false if it is not valid data this is so much easier to read than this all they need to understand from reading this okay we're checking for is if it is valid data and if it is we append it cool makes sense and then all of this checking has essentially been wrapped in this function over here where if someone wants to go into look at the details they can First, we check if the data volume is none. If it is, we return false. And then one by one, we do all these checks. So is correct type. Okay, so now because we've named this variable descriptively, it's easy to see that, okay, here we're checking if the type of the file is correct. The next check is correct bitrate. Okay, just without even thinking about it, we know that, okay, here we're checking if it's correct bitrate. Cool, that makes sense. And again, same for this one. And then at the end, we create this one more variable where is valid data equals if all of these three conditions are met. It's very easy for Jumban to read this piece of code and understand what we are trying to check for. Whereas here, when we haven't named anything and it's all just a one big long if condition, this is really confusing. So this, this is bad, filthy code. Do not write this code. This is good code. And so in summary, tip number one is to wrap long conditionals into variables and then name those variables appropriately. I wouldn't know this because I've definitely not written these really long if conditions, but if I had done that, then I would know that it does actually make the code a lot more confusing. And in the moment, they can feel a bit useless to do that but long-term, it makes it so much clearer and so much easier to read and your team will appreciate it. But again, I wouldn't know that because I've never, I've never made this mistake. Okay. 
Okay, on to step number two. Look at this code for like 10 seconds and tell me if you can tell what is going on. What are we trying to do here? Yeah, okay, this is a very simple example. So you can probably just within like maybe 30 seconds, you can figure out like, okay, we're trying to sum all these numbers. But this is still very unclear. Like what are these numbers over here? What are we even trying to sum here? What is i? Why is it called i? That doesn't even make sense. And then, okay, we printed the s, but why Why are we even doing this? Let me show. So if we just paste this good code over here. Now, just from reading this version of the code, it's, it's just the exact same thing, but you can immediately tell what we're trying to do here. Because this array is called transactions, now you know, like, okay, it's actually an array of transactions, not just some random numbers, right? And because we initialize a sum, just from these two lines, you can probably already tell that, okay, we're probably going to be summing these transactions at some point. And, and this is especially a good feature about Python is because what you can do with your for loops, you can literally just name them like this. Not some random i, but for transaction in transactions. Immediately from reading this, you can tell what we're doing. And what we can do even better here is we can wrap this into a function. Because this function is named very appropriately and very descriptively, you can immediately tell just from three lines, we are summing a list of transactions together. So I hope you got the gist here. But tip number two is to have no ambiguity what Whatsoever when you're naming your variable. Name them absolutely clearly, as pedantically descriptively as you possibly can to make your code read as much like English as you can possibly make it. Now, so far, all of these are very simple steps that you can take to improve your code. But what's even more important than applying all these tactics and strategies to improve your code is just putting in the hours to get better every single day. And in order to put in the hours every single day, you need to enjoy the process. And one of the best ways to enjoy the process is to have a community to share your coding journey with. And that is why I want to briefly talk about a platform called Showcase. Showcase is like a social network, but built specifically for developers. Usually as developers, we would need at least five platforms just to showcase who we are as a developer. Your LinkedIn, GitHub, blog, portfolio site. On Showcase, you can create the developer portfolio instantly and share your tech stack, top repositories, work experience, credentials, and more. Showcase also automatically generates a personal website for everyone where you can attach your own custom domain. You can also build a true network by adding people to your circle, which are people that you've actually worked with and can vouch for your work. And then best of all, at least for me personally, is their job section where you can set preferences for the kind of jobs that you want to find based on things like the languages you know, location, etc. And it will list the jobs and show like the percentage of how much it is a match for your preferences. Oh, and they also have this auto resume builder which literally automatically builds you a resume based on your profile, which just saves so much time. It's a really cool platform. A lot of you have been following me there already. So thanks for Showcase for sponsoring this video and do come join me on the platform by clicking the link down below in the description. Okay, on to tip number three now. This is also on the topic of naming things. If you look at this code over here, what is wrong here? Gen Y Y M M D D H D. You see, see, see what's wrong here? This name is not pronounceable. You might think that this is fine if you're again just writing code for yourself and like, well, the computer doesn't care what it's called. So why should we care about pronouncing? Like imagine having a piece of code like this in your team at your software engineer job and having to communicate to your manager, for example, that what this variable here does. You would go something like, so this variable gen y y y y m m d d h h m m s s over here is going to give the date when the user was created. That's just really unnecessary and it's really confusing. If this date time represents when the user was created, use something like user underscore created underscore on underscore date or even date time. This is pronounceable when you see it. It's number one clear as we talked about in the previous tip. And number two, when you're communicating this to someone else, you can actually pronounce it. And then when you need to write this variable somewhere else, you can actually probably remember how it was written because it's, well, it reads like English, right? On to example number four. Looking at this code over here, we've got a function called fetch and display underscore users. And it does two things here. First, it initializes this users list as a result of some API call, and then it prints each individual user. It might seem fine, but it's actually not because it breaks one of the most fundamental principles of writing functions, which is that functions should do only one thing. You shouldn't have functions doing multiple things. What you should do instead is have two separate functions 
where first you have a fetch users function that fetches the users from the API and then returns them. And then you have a separate function that displays the users. This is so much more clear. This is so much more easy to read because you're not having functions doing like a million different things. And this can be very difficult to sort of wrap your head around, like at least it was for me to figure out, okay, what exactly is one thing? And the best way to think about this probably is that a function does one thing is that whenever you write a function, you should try to sort of extract other functions out of it. Like for example, here, you can see that you could easily wrap this fetching the users into one function. And then a more descriptive name for your function would be do not just display users, but fetch and display users. But then you realize that, wait a minute, because it's an and, it's doing two things. Therefore, fetching of the users should be a separate function. And therefore, with this function, you'd be breaking the function should only do one thing principle. Function shouldn't be giving you any surprises essentially like doing things it's not supposed to do. So then it's sort of annoying if it then turns out that this display users function is also, for example, modifying this users list in some way. So you wanna avoid these type of surprises by not having side effects with your functions. Okay, last example over here. This one right here is extremely filthy. Like you'll probably have to take a shower after watching this because this is such filthy code. So here we've got some transactions in pounds. And then what we would like to do is use this currency converter library to convert these transactions into US dollars. This is filthy. This is dangerously greasy code that we want never to be writing. What we're breaking here, one of the most fundamental principles of writing code, which is do not repeat yourself. As you can see, we're repeating ourselves like literally a million times. Like literally when I was writing this piece of example here, the way I was doing this is literally I was write run transaction and then just copy here and then just change the five here to a six and then change the number. Like when, whenever you're copying your own code, you know you're repeating yourself. Always avoid writing the same piece of code or copying the same piece of code twice because there's probably a way to do it much more easy. Because this is so filthy, I've actually done the clean example in a whole different file to not like contaminate it. This piece of code here does the exact same thing, but in literally around half the lines. So we've got transactions. Again, we're not naming each transaction individually as a variable because that's just a waste of time. Why would we do that? Instead, we just define a list with all of the transactions in pounds. Then we define the converter. And then what we've also done is wrap this into a function. So that again, if someone doesn't want to go and look at the details, they can see immediately, okay, so it's a function that converts from pounds to USD because again, we've named this appropriately. And we can see that we are simply using a for loop to just in two lines loop over all of these transactions. That's literally what loops are created for so that you don't have to repeat yourself. So use the tools that you have in your coding languages. So much easier to write, so much more elegant, so much easier to read. Now just to be clear, this is different from copying code from the internet. Like you'll obviously sometimes, and when I say sometimes, I mean all the time, be copying code from the internet, from the documentation, from when you're searching how to do something. Now that is fine, as long as you make sure you actually understand the stuff that you're copying. But what I mean specifically here, you shouldn't be having to copy your own code or write the same line of code in other time. And that is one of the fundamental principles of coding. Do not repeat yourself ever. There are still a lot of programmers out there in the world writing filthy bad code. So let us now all take it upon ourselves to spread the good word of clean code into the world. I'll be trying to, I'll be trying to do that as well. I promise. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear that I will never write bad filthy code again. And I will also subscribe to the Internet Make Coder YouTube channel and hit the like button down below in the description. But in all seriousness, my name is Internet Make Coder. On this channel, I talk about my journey of teaching myself to code and becoming a self-taught software engineer, essentially teaching to you everything that I had learned during my own journey of learning to code. And if you wanna get more personal stuff for me, I highly recommend you also follow me on Instagram. I've recently moved here to London where my job is gonna be. So if you wanna see what life is like in London and sort of more personal stuff for me, definitely follow me on Instagram. And I've also started a second channel where I'll be posting content about sort of success principles, how I grew this YouTube channel, how to make money online. Definitely go have a look there as well. With that, I'll see you next time.